Hello, everybody. Um, we are live here on Facebook for a special edition of Dr. Jill Live with the two really um, important and precious people um, in my life here today. You might have heard or seen that I was interviewing Greg Tenney, who you can see to the box um, on my side. Um, but I've also got business owner and dear friend Ashley O'Connell here with me as well. I'll introduce them both in a minute. But just to give you a little background, um, if you haven't heard, but gosh, I don't know who hasn't, but in our community, it's hard to miss. Um, maybe you're somewhere though that you haven't heard. We had um, devastating, literally epic proportions in Colorado, the worst um, fire for residential damage in the history of our state. Happened on uh, Thursday, January, I'm sorry, Thursday, December um, 30th. Uh, I was actually out of town and watching from afar. And many of you who maybe aren't in our community saw it on the news and saw playbacks and literally nearly 1000 residential homes were burned to the ground, just completely gone. There's several communities I drive from my home to work each day that are just, there's nothing but rubble and burned um, homes. And lots of our close friends and people that we know dearly as patients uh, have completely lost everything. Uh, in fact, President Joe Biden is going to be here this afternoon on the ground, literally um, moments away from where we're recording uh, to actually visit and see. And we're so grateful for the outpouring of emotional um, support and financial support from all of you um, and just even the federal government, uh, how they're acting quickly and helping because this has really affected um, so many people. And we're going to talk today about what to do after the fire, how to navigate with insurances, how to uh, deal with your air quality. One of our main focuses and why I have business owner and friend Ashley on today is we are both business owners in the epicenter. Literally, our offices shouldn't be standing, neither one of us. We were watching, I was watching from a thousand miles away and looking at the map in my office. If you drew a circle around the center, my office is smack dab in the middle. It should not be standing. And I consider that a miracle and an honor that I still have a place of business. And I'm sure Ashley can agree that we can serve and love the people in our community. And I know her and I both have a heart for how can we really love and serve those people, not only the people who've lost everything, but also our friends and family and community members that are still have businesses that have been affected by the smoke and the damage and the air quality. And again, we're going to go into that today. And I'm going to let Ashley tell a little bit of her story. Um, just a couple fun facts. Uh, Ashley and I met, uh, we, she, she's been a dear friend, but we actually went to Switzerland together a couple of years ago um, for a Swiss mountain retreat and really got to know each other very well as we lost our luggage and had all kinds of <laughs> um, funny experiences in Switzerland. Uh, so so that was how we really met and got to know each other. And we found as female business owners in this small community, we have a lot in common and share a lot of the same goals. She owns Renew Movement in Louisville. And it's the, I probably won't say this right, Ashley, but it's an amazing place to get um, movement, physical therapy. Um, she has some unique uh, methods of doing that. But not only that, she has been a real mover and shaker in community service. She's one of the leading advocates of helping her community. She also now offers IV uh, therapies in her clinic. And so again, we have a lot in common and welcome Ashley. Greg, I wanna introduce you. Um, we met over dinner about a year ago and found out we had a lot in common. And um, he reached out to me. You know, it's funny because um, I got back in town. The fires were Thursday. Friday morning was crazy because the snow came in. And so all of a sudden we had this snowstorm on top of the fires. Thankfully, it put most of that out. And then I flew in that Friday. And on Sunday, I literally got my staff and subleasers together. I said, hey, guys, we need to mobilize. We need to think about what can we do for this community in shock right now. We sat in my office and choked through the smoke for an hour and literally started just with prayer and praying for a community. And then we sat down and said, what can we do? And what we realized was we need to go where the needs are. We don't need to think about what do we want to do, but we need to say, what are the needs? And we knew, we just prayed that as the week progressed and as the months progressed, that the needs would become evident and that we could just be there in our capacity to respond. And we had already a lot of vitamin companies and things um, uh, mobilize and help us. And we're going to be putting together relief packs with some basic nutrients, basic immune support for really anyone in the community who's been affected because this is a stressor and the stressor affects our health. So that's my little area I can help. But what's come across in the last um, just 24 hours is Ashley and I realizing our communities, the buildings that are left, the outdoor air quality is horrendous. Like we're literally, and again, Ashley's going to tell you in just a moment about her employees and herself. And, but I can speak for myself and my employees, 
we're having trouble breathing. I mean, getting a simple breath, even outside is difficult right now with the air quality. We're having burning lungs, we're having headaches, we're having symptoms. So what's come about literally in the last few hours is we need to get clean air to our community. And you know me, you've heard me say a million times, clean air, clean water, clean food. And so I am dedicating my services and my abilities to put contacts and air filters to our community. And we're gonna ask for donations because what we're gonna do is um, we've already secured a massive discount from one of our main air filter suppliers, Austin Air. And I'm gonna ask for donations from some of the other ones as well. And we're gonna to try to mobilize um, some funds to buy air filters for anyone in our community who needs it because some of the buildings that are still standing are actually the worst. In fact, one of my employees has a child in daycare in the midst of the devastation and her child can't go back to daycare because air quality is um, not safe. So this air, we're gonna call this clean air. It's a big deal. And I'll just tell you now, and I'll tell you later right now, if you want more information, we're getting um, together with nonprofits and we will have more information on donations. But right now, if you wanna be signed up to get information on how you can help with the clean air, just email cleanair at my clinic, flatironfunctionalmedicine.com. So just cleanair at flatironfunctionalmedicine.com. And in the next couple of days, you'll get information. If you do want to send a donation, you can put clean air in the memo and you can send it care of my clinic. But like I said, we'll have more information coming out as we go. Okay. So Greg, I want to introduce you. And then I want to go back to um, uh, Ashley and have her tell us about the community. And thank you all for letting me talk for so long. Um, Greg's dedicated his life to service for others. Like I said, we met and the miracle back to that Sunday meeting was I prayed that the resources and the people that I would need to help my clinic and my community would come. And just that very weekend, I got a text from Greg and said, Hey, Jill, you know, I deal with fire disaster and restoration. If there's anything I can do, can I help? And I could just cry, Greg, because you are like an angel, because you came in, you looked at my office on Sunday before the business even opened. You gave me some tips on how to start to remediate. And you have been there this whole entire week. Any questions I have? And then now, of course, giving your knowledge to the public. I am so blessed by you. And I'm so grateful for you reaching out. And again, I have no doubt that was an answered prayer because <laughs> you were there in my time of need. He's a licensed engineer, contractor, Colorado State certified firefighter, NTSB certified first responder in all 50 states, hazmat operations certified, and holds many other awards and certifications. He received training through the Department of Homeland Security, National Transportation Safety Board, State of Colorado, and the American Red Cross. He's a Colorado resident, friend, colleague, and expert in emergency response. We are so blessed to have him here today. And after we get here from both Ashley and Greg, I will try to respond to some of your questions as well. So thank you for that. Ashley, I want to hear from you. You've been in the midst of this just like me. Share with us a little bit about your experience as a community member and then also as a business owner. Well, um, I, I grew up in, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I've lived in Louisville for 15 years and uh, the fire was about a thousand feet from my house. Mm -hmm. Miraculously, we were spared. We, we thought we'd lost it. We evacuated from our home to my business, which is in Old Town Louisville. We then had to evacuate my business to Lafayette, which we were then evacuated to another location. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, immediate needs, we've, we've taken care of a lot of things, but we got back and we've just recognized that we can't breathe. And I don't mean figuratively, I mean, I as well figuratively, but, but literally, um, I own a business, this wellness center in, in downtown Louisville, and my coaches are having headaches. They're having spontaneous nosebleeds. Our chests are burning. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, we're suffering the long-term damage of this. There's so many particulates in the air, homes of, and it, it's not just the the victims of, of the burning themselves, but the people who have homes that are still standing to hear of the amount of soot and what's happening inside of these homes is catastrophic. And then we, we pile stress on top of that. And people in Louisville and Superior, they're suffering. I mean, they really, really, really are. Everybody as a community mm -hmm. is heartbroken and we really need to focus on health. And that's what I love about you, Jill, is that you just, you go after it as, it, so strong and so determined. And I do think raising some money and getting some, some healthy air we, people, we need, we need air literally and figuratively right now. Yes. 
Thank you, Ashley. And thanks for sharing. And literally, we just decided this about 20 minutes ago, hey, can you come on this interview with Greg? <laughs> because I think your perspective is so important as a business owner. And you and I, what I realized too, is I think, oh my gosh, I'm struggling. How do I get employees back in and everything? And it's all of us. It's not just me. And that really just for us to know that we're all in it together and the air quality is so important. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Any other um, things that you want to share or how people can uh, respond um, just for? I think, I mean, we, we went and we launched some donation things and clothing and so many of these needs for the community are being met. There's so yeah. many wonderful organizations involved and I, my heart, is, I'm so grateful, but this is, I don't want to say a blind spot, but it's not something that's being covered. Yeah. This is an absolute need for everybody living in this community is clean air. So yeah. I think that this is critical. We have so many people wanting to donate and wanting to help who are local, who aren't local. And this is, this is a wonderful way to put funds towards helping people for their long-term health. And yeah. we just talk about it, those who are impacted, um, like myself, granted, my home is still standing and I'm so grateful. Many of my friends' homes are not. Yeah. Um, but the collateral damage and the trauma and the long-term health ramifications of this in, entire catastrophic event. So really getting people to bond together and, and this is a wonderful endeavor for our community and I can't thank you enough. Thank you. And thank you, Ashley, because you are a leader. Like I said, you are always there and responding to the needs. And so you are a role model for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a short notice joining us. Um, I, we will be in touch because we'll be doing this effort for clean air. And uh, Absolutely. So I am here to do anything and everything. And I adore you, Jill, from the bottom of my heart. It's mutual. <laughs> thank you so much, Ashley. We'll talk All right. You. Okay. Have bye -bye. a good one. It's nice to meet you, Greg. You as well, Ashley. Thank you. Bye-bye. So Greg, let's turn to focus on you and your expertise. And um, you've put together several resources, um, some sheets of tips and things. And uh, obviously introduce, you've got quite a background in disaster relief and in all kinds of situations like this. Um, how did you first um, get involved in, in fire disaster remediation? I mean, you're a contractor, so you know how to fix things. That's the core. But how did this kind of uh, come about? Was it accidental or? Yes, I would say that it was accidental. Like most people that ended up uh, in insurance restoration about 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I actually went to Florida after Hurricane Andrew. And uh, one of the, uh, that was the first exposure that I had to dealing with a disaster on a major scale. And uh, I have continued working um, actually branching out, obviously, into fire and floods and vehicle accidents, all kinds of property damage that you can think of. And I, I know that we have spoken uh, several times this week, and I just want to reiterate again, Jill, that first and foremost, that people need to be aware, uh, take care of themselves right now. Personal care is so important. This is PTSD. It, this is the same as if you're returning from a military campaign and you've seen friends and acquaintances and people that you've lived and worked with. They're not there anymore. This is a huge, uh, the largest, as you said, the largest disaster in our state's history. And people need to talk and to cry and to reach out to friends and family. Uh, first and foremost, take care of yourself and your children and your pets and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg, for saying that, because it is kind of, even like for me, I immediately go to my clinic standing and my home is standing. And granted, I am so much better off. I don't want to compare myself to those who have lost everything. But for all of us, there's a trauma around seeing our friends and neighbors lose everything and seeing the devastation. Like when I first drove in physically, you can see it on the news, but when you drive by it in person, I was just in my car and I just wept because I saw, oh, there's nothing left in that area that I drove by every single day. And it's all around. The, the crazy thing is literally the devastation. I'm in this epicenter. My clinic is fine. And yet every side there's communities that are gone on every side. So I take that as a, um, I mean, first of all, a huge blessing, but also a gift that I can, I need to, I want to serve because here I am left in the middle of this. <laughs> um, and I'm sure again, you, with your experience, you've seen all of that, but thank you for giving us permission to grieve 
and to actually have those emotions. And even those of you who maybe didn't lose everything that are in the midst of this, it's still shocking and it's trauma. And Greg, what I saw too, as I'm talking to several patients and close friends who really did lose everything, I just even a couple of days ago, as I talked to them and I know the signs of shock, I was like, wow, they're still in complete shock and that's normal. And it's gonna be what we thought when we sat Sunday and had a meeting in my office, we really realized we need sustainable support, which means this is gonna be for months and months. This is not, there's a lot of people right now with their eye on our community, presidents visiting, and that's gonna go away in a few weeks. But the people who are here right. that needs, it's gonna be a long-term need. Tell us a little bit about that as far as like when you've seen disasters and things, um, Obviously, homes don't get built overnight. We have to clear the debris. What kind of timeline would we be looking at? And what what um, what are some of the longer term needs maybe that people have that they aren't thinking about right now? Well, in reality, Jill, it's probably going to be two to three years before most of the homes and businesses are able to be reconstructed. I mean, I've seen resources being mobilized from uh, you know, all across the metro area and the state. And I have friends uh, that own uh, other restoration companies. Uh, and all of us are mobilizing. There's going to be new home construction for the ones that have lost everything. And the people, as Ashley was talking about, who, and you've mentioned when you, you didn't lose your home. And those people have to also understand that. that they have suffered a disaster just as the person who lost everything next door. It may not be to the same degree, but those people also need to allow themselves the opportunity to grieve. And the loss is real. And so often uh, people in general just they don't take we've got to hurry up and we've got to deal with the insurance and we've got to figure out how to get a place to stay and we have to do this and this and this and the to-do list stretches on into infinity but you have to stop and take time seek spiritual solace with your church your mosque your temple whatever it is you know talk with others, pray, meditate, exercise, drink tons of water, you know, do all of these things to take care of yourself, because this is a long term process. This isn't going to be better, like you said, in two weeks from now, when the news media moves on to the next thing, and President Biden is gone, uh, working on the next disaster, this is going to be very real and impacting these people's lives for the next three years at a very at the very least. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. And so just from that perspective, um, obviously this clean air is huge, but taking proper nutrition, making sure, and I'm sure those who are displaced, it's harder to get good food and make things that you normally would make at home. Uh, so just, uh, I would also encourage really, truly, um, that was the thought on Sunday. Again, when we met was wait a second, it's so easy. You're like, oh my gosh, let's do this and do this. And we have to do it quick. If we just pause and breathe, if we can get a good breath of clean air. And, and like you said, really um, connect with people, uh, take the time to grieve. What I know about trauma too, is trauma gets stuck in our bodies if we don't release the emotion. So this is a perfect time where you do want to connect with friends and family, talk about it, um, you know, meet with people. I know they're having community meetings uh, virtually over this next few days um, in each uh, neighborhood that's been affected by Louisville. So you can get that community. And I'm sure there's also groups and things, community and some of the next door um, things online and, and just staying in touch with your neighbors, I think is really, really important. Um, let's move on to practical because you have a list I have here in front of me that you made up or you created. It's super practical. I was thrilled. Um, so let's talk about what what's um, you're, you're facing this devastation, whether your home has been damaged or you've lost everything or you're in the community and you're dealing with soot and that. How, how do you start with insurance? How do you start with organizing your thoughts? Give us a little bit of practical tips on that dealing with um, what to do after the fire. Well, one of the uh... One of the things that uh, I want to let people know is <clears throat> over these next couple of weeks and months, uh, you're going to be uh, hit with an incredible amount of information. Um, none of us would be able to remember everything that is going to be thrown at us, that we're going to be confronted with. The, our very first recommendation in any situation like this is by yourself 
a nice thick spiral bound notebook with uh, pockets because what you need to start doing is writing down all of these questions that you have write down uh, for people who have suffered actual damage to their property whether they lost it or it's just smoke uh, write down your claim number, the adjuster, your insurance company. One of the things that I also want to remind people is almost all of us have property insurance for our homes and businesses and really understand that you, you, your best option at this moment in time is to partner with your insurance company and especially your adjuster because they are going to be one of your best resources to assist you to return to a sense of normalcy. Um, and I recommend a spiral bound notebook with pockets so you can tuck in receipts, you can write down, you know, as I said, your claim number, your adjuster's name, all his contact information, you can write down any questions that you have and they're going to appear uh, over and over, what do I do about this? You know, we are going to be confronted with temporary housing issues and food. People who have who lost their homes, you're going to have to go out and buy clothes. You know, you don't really think about things like that, but it becomes these things add up rather quickly when you have to go out and buy seven new pairs of underwear and T-shirts and all of the things that we take for granted. Personal care items like a toothbrush, a hairbrush, a comb, all of these things that we, you know, they're just part of our daily lives and they were gone or they are gone now. So that would be the very first thing that I would tell people to do is get yourself a notebook and start writing these things down. And you can also use that as a release for your own emotions too. You can track how you're dealing with it. Mm, yeah. Thank you for that bit. Cause those are the kind of things And what I found with the patients and people, friends that I've talked to that have lost, it's almost like that state of shock. They it's easy to repeat yourself. It's hard to, um, I had one friend who lost their home and son is nine. And he went in the next day at school, had to take a test. The mom, I couldn't think. And I'm like, Oh, you want to cry because of course you can't think like there's no, there's the executive function in our brain is meant to organize details, make a plan, follow it through when you're in shock, that executive function is gone. So have some compassion on yourself, whether you've lost this or you're in the community dealing with this, because it may take a little time for you to have a lot of short-term memory and even the ability to put together a plan. It's literally like your shock and fight or flight system takes over and prevents the ability for you to think logically. So that's all normal. Like I want to normalize that. And again, if you ask questions twice or three times, or you have to write things down, just have compassion with yourself right now, because that is so normal until you, the shock wears off. Um, what about some, uh, you had some things in here that I thought were really helpful about practical language of insurance that obviously I didn't know. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about the basic terms if you're dealing with an insurance company, what those kinds of things that you might want to know, just maybe, maybe the top three or four terms that are critical? Yeah, the uh, whenever you're dealing with uh, a new situation, there's going to be a language that is particular to that situation, especially in an industry that's as widespread as property insurance. Uh, and if you can educate yourself and get a little bit of knowledge, it can help you a great deal as you're moving forward through this process. Uh, simple things like uh, you'll hear adjusters talk to you about your ALE. Well, what does ALE mean? Honestly, what that really means is your additional living expenses. Those things that I mentioned a moment ago, like your toothbrush or clothes that you need to purchase, all of those things now are going to generally be part of your covered loss. That is the additional living expense that you are going to take on uh, as a result of not being able to live in your home and having lost everything. Um, there are different kinds of coverages like replacement cost value. You'll hear people talk about the RCV or ACV, the actual cash value. Uh, we all know if you buy a new car and you drive it off the lot, it decreases in value, say 10% when you drive it off the lot. That's called the depreciation. And that's the difference between replacement cost value and actual cash value. Uh, most policies in Colorado are written so that you have replacement cost value. So your home will be restored to what it was, 
you know, right before this devastating loss happened. Uh, things like personal property. Uh, we have resources that I've built over the years. Uh, we have lists that come, uh, some of them are pre-filled out to list items, say in your living room or your dining room, things that you don't necessarily think about, the uh, end tables or the coffee table or the couch. We have some of these things already listed so that it will spark individuals' memories. Oh yeah, and we had the bookcase over there. You're going to need to make a list of your personal property. That's all of the things that you own that are not part of the house. They're not attached to the house because those have to be replaced as well. And trying to make a list uh, can seem overwhelming at first. And that's why we've separated it out. We uh, go room by room with these sheets to help people. For instance, in your kitchen, you know, you have all these small appliances, a coffee maker, these various things. You don't have to do it all at once, but it is something that uh, you need to, once again, put in your notebook so that you keep track of them. And as days go by, you will think of additional things. Um, so many of us now have, uh, you know, smartphones that automatically save our pictures someplace in the cloud that we don't, I don't even know about how to, how to access them or do anything with them, but I know they're there because it keeps telling me I'm out of memory. Mm -hmm. You can access those. Uh, most of us would have to ask our kids, but get those photographs, uh, especially if you've had, you know, weddings or anniversaries, birthday parties, any kind of function at your home where you may have had photographs taken. Um, ask friends and relatives for assistance with those kinds of things, because those will also serve as uh, ways to jar your memory because that's going to be one of your big jobs as a homeowner right now when you've lost everything trying to recreate everything that you own it's going to seem as it's an, as though it's an overwhelming task but if you take it as i said room by room approach it slowly and methodically and realize it doesn't have to be done in a week or two weeks, you have a year under most policies in Colorado to uh, make these lists and present them to your insurance company. So once again, partner with your adjuster because he or she is going to be in one, probably in the best position to help you move forward on some of these things. Mm, that's super helpful, Greg, because yeah, when you just talk about that, it's kind of overwhelming to think about it's like, wow. Um, what about uh, one thing that we, you and I talked about in my business was uh, being underinsured. And it sounds like you've had a lot of experience with that. What's your experience with percentage of people who are underinsured and um, what they might be able to do about that? Uh, there are uh, several <clears throat> aspects to uh, being underinsured. Again, uh, first and foremost, the, the best resource that you're gonna have uh, is to talk with your insurance company and discuss what your coverages are, because very, very often uh, your adjuster will be able to look into your policy. Um, I can tell you uh, from one year ago, a major house buyer out in Pine, Colorado, the adjuster looked deeply into their policy and he was able to find actually a 10% additional coverage for debris removal. And since the loss was a half a million dollars and they were very close to their policy limits, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the insurance adjuster had found an additional $50,000 in coverage to help them rebuild their home. Mm -hmm. So once again, I know that we've all heard, I don't wanna say horror stories because that's not really true, but we've all heard mm -hmm. anecdotes from people about how they were rooked by their insurance company. And I want to comfort people and just let them know that in the majority of ca the cases, that is not the case. These people are out there. They honestly, they're like you and I, Jill, they want to help people that are in the middle of this horrific loss right now. That, that's their job. And they are the best equipped to do that. Mm, yeah, so I love the partner with your adjuster because it really does sound like, and again, in my experience so far, it's been, I've been shocked at, she's, you know, very much like, okay, here's an idea that we can do. I'm like, wow, you're wanting to really help me. This is great. So um, I love that. Um, 
What about uh, going back to the property, uh, driving? I mean, again, to me, there's lots of dangers. Um, if you're walking around and there's embers or there's electrical now, clearly our community has taken care of all the gas. And I think gas has been restored and heat has been restored to most homes, but they methodically over the week, house by house by house, checked electrical gas. But what are some of the kind of hidden dangers around a site that's been burned or flooded or damaged that you'd want to really warn people about from a contractor perspective kind of? Well, when you're, uh, when you've had a home that's completely damaged, I would say uh, one of the biggest dangers that you're going to face is you've already touched on it. Um, and I know living the, through these last two years that we are all so sick and tired of, about hearing uh, of masks. Yeah. But yeah. before you walk onto the building site, you're breathing in air constantly. All, most of us are eight to 12 breaths every minute. Mm -hmm you have to wear a mask before you start sifting through these ashes. Uh, today, the building materials that we use, the houses, they're filled with so many man-made products that a lot of them use uh, oil as the basis. Most plastics are derived from oil. When these things burn, they release incredibly toxic gases and I understand that they're not in the air at the moment but the minute that you begin sifting through the ash and looking for those mementos from your life and trying to find the things that you know meant so much to you you've got to be wearing respiratory protection because it these things can be deadly and we who work in this industry on a regular basis we have to do it. I have, I am responsible yeah. legally to teach my employees how to wear masks properly and which mask to use. Uh, N95 particulate mask is probably the best thing that most people can do for themselves right now. The other thing that I would caution people is when you're going into your property, especially if it's been completely burned, if you have a basement or crawl space, be very, very aware about the potential for collapse mm -hmm. because you're, it's going to look like everything is fine, but you can't see yeah. underneath one or two feet of ash right. how badly destroyed the structural members of the floor or the crawl space system are. And the other thing is for a lot of people whose homes were not destroyed, as you mentioned, I mean, Excel Energy went out and purchased 20,000 electric heaters and they were just giving them to people because they knew the gas had been shut off and we're, they were trying to help quote unquote mitigate the damage. Mm -hmm. um, as a property owner, all of us are responsible to mitigate any additional damage. And that means prevent the water pipes from freezing. That's one of the biggest things that happens after a fire, especially in late fall mm -hmm. and during the winter, we've got no heat. Yes. So all of a sudden pipes start to freeze and you may not know they're frozen until the heat comes back mm -hmm. on a week or two down the road. But then now you have- Then Greg, we have flooding and mold, which is- <laughs> Right. Right. I mean, and, and one of the things that we can be grateful for, I know I've heard it on several, uh, several news broadcasts, is if we would have gotten the snow 18 hours earlier, it wouldn't have happened. Well, even though it did happen and we didn't get the snow until we did, one of the things that we can be incredibly grateful for is we got this moisture that tamped down all the ash. It wet the debris. And so the ash cloud and all of these particulates that can be so dangerous to people's health, they're trapped on the ground right now under the snow and by the water. It's one of the best things that could have happened because when we're doing demolition and cleanup on disasters like this, one of our major uh, ways to combat the dust, obviously, and particulates is to continually keep the site wet yeah. so that yeah. we're not releasing the dust into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this is so practical. I love it because like you said, and even our building, we had no heat. And, and so we dripped, of course, the faucets, we had the water running, everything was fine. But can you imagine the devastation? You have all these burned homes and the next door you have this water and even the ones that were doused with water. I saw that and that thank goodness for the firefighters. But honestly, that home has a lot to deal with too, because that uh, wetness, moisture, you and I know I work with mold all the time and you do as well. There's going to be a lot of mold that's going to come in the next several months as well in these homes. And that worries me. Um, like I said, I'm going to do everything I can as a physician to educate people on mold. I also wanted to just quickly read, Greg, I ironically, I wrote an article before any of this happened on wildfire smoke and some of the stuff that's released. And I literally have a list here, acetaldehydes, acid gases, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that's like from charred and, and burned woods, benzene, toluene, styrene, heavy metals, dioxins, and these are all super toxic things to your body. Like I've been testing for 20 years, patients urine for toxic load. And I already see these. I would not be surprised if our exposure and some of the stuff Ashley and I are describing in our community and the air quality is because of benzene and tooling and heavy metals. And cause it literally, if I'm in, if I'm near my office outside, my lungs are burning. So I know there's stuff in the air. Um, well, and so many of those chemicals that you just mentioned are, they're used in all aspects of building today. I mean, from the glue and mastic that mm -hmm. we use to put down, uh, you know, laminate floors or hardwood floors or carpet, all of these things, uh, when they burn, those gases and those chemicals are released into the atmosphere. And now they're going to be sitting in the ashes that people are going to have to sift through to try to recover yeah. a portion of their lives. Yeah. So again, if you're out there and anywhere near this, you want to be sure and wear those masks and get the good uh, filtration N95s or even the ones that have the charcoal filters for painters. Those are as good or even better. Um, you probably know about this in the industry. I'm just learning. So you can correct me if I say this wrong, but I know that there's particulate uh, matter and we can actually measure that in air quality meters. And the 10 and five particulate matter is a larger dust and pollen and debris. Usually it's visible, but there's a 2.5 micron. It's about the size of E. coli uh, virus are a little smaller than that, but this is pretty invisible and it can get suspended in the air. So right now, probably some of the stuff that we're breathing, Greg, would you say that's probably that 2.5 or less microns that's suspended and can be, again, these chemical laden. It's almost like the particulate, the dust gets the chemical on it. And again, do you want to explain a little bit about that? Because you talked to me about the blinds and the static and sometimes how that particulate can be where the chemicals actually attach. Is there um, anything worth talking about in that realm? No, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, gases are different, obviously, than particulates. Particulates are relatively simple, depending on the size, as you mentioned, to block using a mask. Uh -huh. If uh, you have a situation where you're fairly certain that these toxic gases uh -huh. have been released, like benzene and toluene yeah. and xylene and all of these things that are used in so many of our building materials, you're absolutely right. That's going to require uh, a more, uh, I guess, a more advanced mask, if you will, one of the full face respirators that does have a charcoal activated and other filters that will stop these gases from being able to, uh, from getting into our bodies. Yeah. And you also have to remember, um, you know, so many of us don't think about this, but it isn't just breathing. You know, when you touch these things, they are also absorbed through your skin. And that's why we recommend wearing, uh, you know, good, a uh, good solid pair of nitrile or uh, rubber gloves, because when you get these substances on you, they are absorbed through your skin as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks for saying that, because that's exactly it. Like with so many of the new drugs and chemicals and even natural hormones that we use are topical because our skin is a great reservoir to get things in. So that's a really great, and at least washing your hands and everything before and after. It's kind of like the COVID has this very well trained, but it's more than that even, because even those N95s aren't going to completely protect you from the gases. This they is one reason. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're <laughs> absolutely correct. Particulate masks will not Correct. protect you against gases at all yeah. okay gases do not they're not stopped by uh 
particulate mask, even an N95 or the high quality surgical mask, that in that case, you need a gas filtration respirator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually true. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you clarified. And that's also one of the reasons back to our air filters and trying to get this to the community. The two companies that I'm partnering with, um, and I'm open if any of you out there want to donate other ones, but I want a filter that has a great HEPA filter that'll go down to 0.3 microns, which is usually that smallest particle size. It actually, like our Austin Airs in our office, filter viral particles that small. Um, but also, as Greg's saying, we want a carbon or charcoal filter in there to do as much as possible with the VOCs, the volatile organic chemicals and compounds, which are actually fumes and nothing but charcoal and, and some sort of activated um, porous substance. That's how you get those filters. That's why those big masks with the two charcoal filters on either side that painters use or that auto body shops use, those are the kinds of masks that Greg's talking about if you really have yes. an exposure that, that's going to filter out the fumes. And I wonder, Greg, you may not know the answer to this. I don't know that I do, but as Ashley and I talk about the burning and the symptoms that we're having, um, we've done a lot of cleaning already. We have filters going. I wonder if some of this is more the fumes than the particulate. Any thoughts on what that might be left over in the air still, or maybe both? <laughs> yeah, it's right now. It's it's so it's so recent. I mean, you know how much cleaning your building yes. owners have already done, and you walk in from the outside and it's there immediately. You mm -hmm. still smell it. It has not gone away. You, now, some of it is being masked somewhat by some of the cleaning chemicals that they use, but when you walk in, you're still noticing it. This is not going to be something that is going to dissipate in a week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and again, we are, the great news is with Greg's help and with our, I am doing a abundance of measures so that we can restore that for the health of our employees and, and patients. Um, so in our last few minutes, Greg, uh, we've covered a lot. Um, and any other thoughts or things that we haven't covered related to either people dealing with this or even just the community in general? Yeah, I here's something. Um, I want to, first of all, preface it by saying I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, a mental health professional or even particularly mentally healthy myself. <laughs> But I do want to, um, as I sat here this morning, um, I made a list of a few things and I want people really, and I'm happy to provide, you know, as you said, we put together a brochure about replacing documents, resources that people can uh, turn to at this point in time. Um, also the after the fire handout that we've put together. I'm happy to give this as well, but these are some things that I really would like again to reiterate and get out there to people, especially for dealing with their children. Okay, uh, the first thing is limit media exposure. Yeah. Don't let your kids watch 24 seven how horrible the disaster is because that's what sells news, but that's not good for your children or your mental health. Focus on the positive things. Focus on each other, the, th the, the fact that you have each other. Uh, recognize and share your feelings. I know a lot of us are, I don't mean to be touchy-feely or, we all know what that means. Yeah, yeah. Re recognize and share your feelings, especially with the people that are close to. Reach out to and accept help from other people. Be willing. Uh, do things that you guys enjoy together as a family so that you can begin building new positive memories after the fact. I know this is going to sound crazy, but be thankful. Absolutely. Be thankful that you have your family because in the end, that's what matters to all of us. Stay connected with your family, uh, with your friends, with your church, with community groups that you are part of. Uh, realize that recovery physically for your home or offices, mentally and spiritually for all of us. Realize that this is going to take time. It's not going to be a quick process. And you need to do this on a day-by-day -day basis. And I know you will love this, Jill, because you told me before that this is one of your favorite words. Just remember the resilience of the human body and spirit. We can get through this together and we can come out on the other side stronger and better than we were, especially as our community pulls together. 
Oh, Greg, that is what a beautiful way to end. I uh, so appreciate you. I so appreciate all the time and effort already you've given to my, myself and my clinic and the community. Um, in just a moment, I want to be sure people can find you. So we'll give them your website and email. But thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really mean that when I said you're like an angel, you were an answered prayer for me. And I know you're going to be that for a lot of other people who are suffering. Um, thank you all for listening. And I'm just going to repeat what I said earlier. You will have more details. So probably by the time this is recorded for the podcast and YouTube, we'll have have a lot more details specific, but right now we're setting up a fund to donate um, air filters from two of the main companies that I work with to anyone in our community that needs them. That would include homes standing or homes gone uh, because the ones that are still have homes and businesses standing need it just as much right now. So um, if you want to be part of that donation effort, we would love your support. You can email cleanair at flatironfunctionalmedicine.com clean air at flatironfunctionalmedicine.com and we'll get you in touch with exactly how to set that up and do that if you're interested. Um, thank you for listening today, Greg. Thank you. How can people find you, reach you? Let's get your email and website. Um, so that people yeah, the, easiest, the easiest way is uh, you can reach out to me via uh, email. It's just my name, greg at therestorationguild.com. Awesome. And then perfect. So email Greg at the restoration guild.com. I'll be sure and put that in the comments here and wherever you're watching or listening to this. Um, thank you all again. Thank you for your prayers from afar. Um, our community needs it and we appreciate it so much. And yet, like you said, Greg, um, we're here, we're alive and uh, the things that really matter, we are, I am so grateful. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Jill.